You know, if you were to open the Bible and read it, God calls you a lot of things, and all of them are good. He has distinctives for his people that make us unique from anybody else on the planet. Stick around. We're going to talk about some of them. Turn to Genesis chapter 1, and as I go there, God created the heavens and the earth. Stay with me now. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens first and then the earth. Why? Because the Bible says that everything seen comes out of what is not seen. The Bible says the seen is temporary, the unseen is eternal. So God created the unseen world first. Why? Because it does not change. And the unseen world is invisible. It does not mean it's not there. It means our eye cannot perceive the image. So there are things dancing 12 inches above your head that would blow your mind, but your eye can't see it. It's a whole world. And the Bible says that the one that you can't see is actually the one that's real. And he says, the one you can see is the one that's lying to you. Because the just don't live by sight, they live by... So faith cometh by hearing. So I've got to hear what God says and ignore what I see. Because what God said is true and what I see is lying. Can I keep going? I'm going to keep pushing it. <laughs> okay. So God made the heavens, and then out of that sprang the earth. The earth was to be a physical expression of heaven. It was to be run like heaven, operated like heaven, and its first place was called Eden, which means perfection. The word heaven means paradise. So the first physical expression in the earth was a place just like heaven. It was a place of perfection. And then he put a physical expression of, his, of himself there where he could look and see his own reflection, his own image, his own likeness, and that physical expression was called Adam. The the difference between Adam and God is that God is a spirit and Adam wore flesh. And then God made this declaration, and if you ever study the kingdom, like I'm going to be teaching you uh, while I'm your pastor, you understand that a king, once he makes a decree, even the king cannot go back on his own word. We don't understand king because we live in a democracy and we have a president, not anything the same as a king. When a king makes a decree, it cannot be undone. So God makes this decree, let man, Adam is a man, let man have dominion. The root word of dominion is domain. Domain means a particular jurisdiction or province that has a governor. So God made a man with a body. And then the king made this declaration, let man have dominion in the earth. Man will be earth's governor. Man will rule the earth like I rule the heavens without me being there. So in other words, you have to have a body to have authority in the earth because that is man's domain. Psalm 139 says, heaven he is made for God, but the earth he's made for the sons of man. Earth is for flesh, the heavens are for spirit. So we get here, and God said, let man have dominion in the earth. Now, here's the dilemma. Everything we don't know how to explain, you know what we say? God is in control. <laughs> Preachers, pull up everybody. God is in control. I didn't get where they can sing it now. God, yeah, there we go. Oh, God is in control. Oh, oh, oh. You know. God is in control is code for I have no idea how to explain that. <laughs> and now God gets blamed for everything. So a tornado will get loose in the Midwest, wipe out two subdivisions, 12 people will get killed, and we'll say God is in control. 
So the earth will open up and swallow people in an earthquake. We say God is in control. Or a hurricane will wipe out an entire coastline. We'll say God is in control. Even the insurance man shows up and calls it an act of God. My God does not tear up subdivisions. My God does not tear up coastlines. I'm going to mess with you. I see some of you right now. You're real, real smart. I'm going to mess you up. I can see your mind just working. You're going to figure me out. I'm going to mess you up. Hallelujah. We get ownership and authority confused. The Bible does, says just the opposite. The Bible said Adam was in control. In fact, God even told Adam, you are so in charge, whatever you call it, that's what it is. <laughs> he said, the animals, the trees don't even have an identity till you name it. Let man subdue it, fill it, multiply it. It is your domain. Adam, rule it well. Adam, if it gets better, it's going to be because of you. Adam, if it gets worse, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That is ownership. Ownership has never been in question. But if you've ever had a lease or if you've ever rented anything or you lease or rent something now, you don't own it, but you are in charge of the activity that goes on there during the duration of the lease. The earth is on a lease. We know that at some time, the God said he's going to bring all, he's going to culminate all things. The Bible actually says that the earth will burn up and God will create a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. I know that's what's out there waiting for me in Revelation. So right now, the earth is on a timetable and during the duration of the lease, God gave man dominion over the earth. The fact is, if God was in control, he'd have this thing fixed before lunch. Why then, when Jesus laid down in the boat and the Bible says a great tempest arose, a great storm arose, so that the wind and waves were beating the boat and the Bible says to the place it was going to sink. And Jesus was awakened as they panicked and thought they were going to die, stepped to the bow of the boat, stretched out his hand, and the Bible says he rebuked the storm. If God is behind all that controlling it, then Jesus would have been rebuking his father. And Jesus made it clear, I and the father are one. I only say what I see my, what I hear my father say. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. He said, I have come to fulfill the will of the one who sent me. You will never see the father and the son contradict each other. The son proceedeth out of the father and they're always saying the same thing, doing the same thing, speaking the same thing. Never would God be behind the wind and Jesus rebuked the wind that his father is behind. So God delegated authority in the earth to Adam and made the earth his domain. So you had to have flesh to have authority in the earth. Matthew chapter 8, throw it on the screen and then go quickly to John chapter 1. I'm losing my time here, but I'm going to preach this thing and finish it before I let y'all go. Is that all right? You can't stop this message halfway. So when he come to the other side to the country of the he can't Romo say, there he met two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce so that no one could pass by. Next verse. And suddenly they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you son of God? Why are demons screaming out, Jesus, you son of God? Have they all of a sudden gone on an evangelistic crusade and want everybody to know who he is? I don't have time to unpack it. Go home today and fact check me. Every time Jesus confronts demonic powers, they always refer to him as son of God. Jesus is son of man and son of God. 
And Jesus had authority in the earth, not because he was son of God. He had authority in the earth because he was son of man. Because God is a spirit, and a spirit has no authority in the earth without flesh. So when demons would see Jesus coming, they would say, why are you here? You're not from here. You're from heaven. You're from God. You have no jurisdiction here. You're not supposed to be in the earth. You can't cast us out, and it didn't matter because Jesus cast them out anyway. Hallelujah. Because Jesus was man enough to know what I'm going through, but he was God enough to deliver me. Jesus was man enough to be hungry, but he was God enough to take five loaves and two fish and feed 5,000. Jesus was man enough to know my sorrows, but he's also God enough to heal my broken heart. Come on, somebody. Jesus is man enough to cry when Lazarus dies, but he's God enough to say, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus is man enough to die on a cross but on the third day, he's got enough to come out of the grave again. He is the son of man, and he is the son of God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Ah, do you feel the weight of this thing? Distinction is the latest series from Ron Carpenter. That's why I die to myself and I say, God, whatever you want me to do, show me what your will is. And then I become God wrapped in flesh in the earth. God wrapped in flesh. God wrapped in flesh. Somebody shout, I am anointed. Everything you're supposed to be is already in you. God wants you to discover the real you with distinction. You are the exception. Why that mean shout, I'm the exception. Oh, there's a distinction that God is making between his people and people who are not. And if you want to be on God's side, put your hands together and shout amen. This eight message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen. Can I go deeper? Give me a few more minutes. Give me a few more. Luke 3:38. Luke chapter 3 is that boring chapter that everybody skips even preachers because it's a genealogy. And so and so begot so and so and so and so begot so and so and so and so begot and it's and it seems boring. I promise you if God's given you a genealogy there's a reason. But in this genealogy in Luke, he doesn't start back with the first Adam. He starts with Jesus and counts it back. And so he says, Jesus, the son of, Jesus, the son of, Jesus, the, I mean, and he goes back, the son of, the son of, the son of, the son. And he goes all the way back, the son of Enosh, who is the son of Seth, who's the son of Adam. Son of God? Wait a minute, you mean there's two of them? Ooh, might better read the genealogies. The first Adam was created and begotten of God. The earth was his domain. Satan came, disguised as a serpent, tricked Eve, they so much, y'all, tricked Eve, Eve was, Adam was not tricked. Adam rebelled. There was no deception to it. Because Eve turned around and told him about the fruit, and he said, give me some. And then he threw the woman under the bus when God called him in accountability. <laughs> he said, what happened? He said, this woman... So Eve was deceived, Adam rebelled. So we know that in our flesh, women are more prone to deception because of your fleshly mother Eve and men are more prone to rebellion. I wish I had time to fool with that. I do not have time, but come to the marriage conference when we announce it, hallelujah. So Adam rebels. At that time, the one who deceived and got them to rebel against God was ready to swiftly take over the reins. 
And Ephesians 2 declares to us that Satan is the God of this world. That's troubling because we want to think God's in control. That's not who God says is in control. The word God of this world, the word world don't mean planet. It means cosmos. It means systems. Systems that govern a society. I know you got all your favorite politicians, but they can't fix it. Why? Because they don't govern it. If you want to govern it, you need to pray. Because the Bible says Satan is the God of this world. So now the systems are broken and the world is chaotic. Why? Because God delegated the governorship of it to Adam and he lost it. So now let me read this to you right here. Uh, Galatians 3, 26, then I'm going to go to Romans 8. Galatians 3. For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Not all male son. In the Bible, sonship is very powerful. It's a position and it has to do with inheritance. So now Adam, the son of God, rebelled and lost it. Then the Bible says that Jesus is the second or the last Adam, and he's the son of God. This is so much more than getting saved, going to church, and doing good. If you want to know why Jesus came, then you got to look at what Adam lost. Jesus didn't come so you could say a prayer and go to church a couple of times a month. Jesus came to restore his original intent for man in the earth because the earth is out of order and it's groaning in the pains of childbirth awaiting for somebody to put it back in order. So now we know that Jesus was the last Adam and God gave his only begotten son that he who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Why did he give it? Because he so loved the world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It didn't say for God so loved people. He looked at all of it and said it's very good. And he's lost all of it. And now he sent Jesus to get all of it back. So God didn't send Jesus to just fix people. He sent Jesus to fix it all. Oh my goodness, I'm losing so much of my cry. I'm hearing ooh and oh and mmm and everything but amen. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, this is my last scripture, and I'll close after I read these 18 through 21. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed. I always was taught when I was growing up, glory was heaven. But look where it says it is right there. It didn't say it's for me. It said it's where? Oh, 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 oh. I ain't got time to mess with that one. Come back next week. In other words, what's happening to me is nothing compared to what it's producing in me. And what's happening to me will be temporary, but what God's doing in me will last forever. 19. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Oh. So the thing that God created is waiting on somebody. Eagerly. We've been preaching us waiting on the second coming of Jesus. I believe Jesus is coming again. I believe it so much I'm going to be on the first load out. <laughs> but we're not supposed to be passive waiting for Jesus to come fix everything. The Bible says creation is eagerly waiting on something else. Waiting for the revealing. Revealing means it's already there, but the lid has not been taken off of it yet. It has not been uncovered. Oh, God. Oh, God. Verse 20. For creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly. It didn't want to be. But because of him who subjected it. Adam forfeited creation. And now it's rocking and reeling like a drunken man. Why do we have floods? Because it don't know how much to rain. 
Why do we have hurricanes? Because the breeze don't know how hard to blow. Why does the earth open up? Because it don't know when it should shift and when it shouldn't shift. It doesn't know because it has no governor. It has no ruler. And the earth now has become a playground for evil. Verse 21, because creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and to the glorious liberty of who? <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. Pastor, this is heavy. I just wanted to come in here a little sermon and go get me something to eat. This is heavy. <laughs> and we're looking and praying for answers, not knowing that the earth's answer is in this room. It said that, in fact, I could carry on up to verses 25, 26, and 27. It said that the earth is literally in the, chains, in the pains of childbirth, awaiting the revealing of the sun. In other words, every time you hear of another natural disaster, the earth is, oh, oh, why? It's tired of being governed outside of godly leadership. And it knows it's futile. It knows it's not right. And it's groaning. And why is it in the pains of childbirth? Because it's trying to push out a church that has been impotent, come on, and been lazy and had no power and had no voice. But I hear the sound of a different kind of church that is arising, one that God is restoring its power and its voice to. If you want to be a part of that church, shout hallelujah. Last verse. Verse 14, chapter 8. Who are these sons? Adam, the son of God, lost it. Jesus come, and here's what he's talking about. Behold, I give you authority. Jesus knows exactly what I asked him. He didn't say, hey, I give you ownership. It never lost possession. It lost a governor. There's nobody having dominion in it anymore. What did Jesus take from Satan? The keys. Death, hell, and the grave. And then he, who did he say had the keys? He said, behold, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth, it'll be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, it'll be loosed in heaven. In other words, you can tithe, heaven open up. You hold your tithe teeth up, it'll be closed. He said, the key's in your hand. Everything's a key. Everything's a key. He said, if you use your key, heaven will open up and you'll have access to it. He said, if you don't use your keys, it'll, it'll remain closed to you. You'll be saved, but you won't live in heaven. Heaven will not have access to your home. It won't touch your address because you've got to use the keys. And everything Jesus taught was a key key. It was not the way to be good and be stay saved. It was a key. The keys of the kingdom. Distinction is the latest series from Ron Carpenter. That's why I die to myself and I say, God, whatever you want me to do, show me what your will is. And then I become God wrapped in flesh in the earth. God wrapped in flesh. God wrapped in flesh. Somebody shout, I am anointed. Everything you're supposed to be is already in you. God wants you to discover the real you with distinction. You are the exception. Wave at me and shout, I'm the exception. Oh, there's a distinction that God is making between his people and people who are not. And if you want to be on God's side, put your hands together and shout amen. This eight-message series is available for your gift of $40 or more. Call now and we will include free shipping and an MP3 download card. Call now or visit roncarpenter.com or write to the address on your screen.
You know what, this is probably one of the last few years of my favorite teachings because it's not only a part of the core values that I believe as a Christian, but it also is so many of the new things that God has been showing me in the Word of God. I hope that you are enjoying this teaching on distinction and we're just scratching the surface as we're gonna go deep into this thing. Let me just take a minute and tell you how much I'm grateful for all of you who have been partners for so long. I really do thank you for all that you help us to do. You know that we are viewer supported. You don't see us running Coca-Cola ads. You don't see us running, trying to sell cell phones. You don't see us doing any of that. All you see us doing is bringing you the Word of God from beginning to end. So that means we depend on the people of God to join with me in this cause and love it as much as I love it and help us take it all over the world. Thank you for all you do, your prayerful support, your financial support, your monthly partners, many of you, maybe not monthly, but you're just every now and then intermittent givers. I say thank you for that. And I want to invite a new people, a new group of people into our family. Uh, we do what we do and we take it very seriously. And there's a team of people with me that we believe that Jesus Christ is the greatest message in the universe. And we've committed our whole life to take it all over the world. TV is not the only thing to do, but it is one of the most important things we do. And we want to take it further. We're on TV on many parts of the globe. But one of our next steps is we are trying to find ways to translate these things into these native tongues to the people that we're sending it to. It does no good if you just see me. You might see the spirit of it, but you have no understanding of what I'm saying. And we're trying to put the things technologically and personnel-wise together so that when we do reach another part of the world, they can hear it in the way they understand it. Would you help us as we continue to always try to go further and go to the next level? Maybe you've never given and you'd like to for the first time. Maybe you're used to, and you say, you know what, I've let back, I've gotten a little slack, and I want to be diligent again. Well, for your first offer, whether it's a one-time or whether you want to become a monthly partner, we have this gift we're going to send you. And all this gift does, it's not a payback, it's a thank you that says we value the fact that you value us. And we're so grateful for this relationship we're starting together. So many ways I can connect with you. Go to all my sites, Twitter. Um, go to Facebook, go to Instagram, go by the website, check it out, go to our online bookstores. We got all kinds of resources made available to you because at the end, we just want to make sure that we're sowing something in you and investing to make your life better. I'm grateful for our relationship. I'm grateful for the time that you've given us. And I believe that the next thing that God does is always the best. I'll see you soon. Join us every week for another exciting message from Ron Carpenter. And until then, visit us online at roncarpenter.com and discover encouraging resources to help you reach your greatest potential in your Christian walk. And when you visit, consider partnering with our ministry team to help us take this life-changing message to the world. Our goal is to take the message and ministry of Ron Carpenter to a worldwide audience, but we can only do it with your help. And don't forget to connect with Ron every day through social media. Thank you so much for being a part of this ministry, and we'll see you again next time for another challenging message with Ron Carpenter.